Okay, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, this is Jonathan in the Elder Care Network webinar series and joining us once again is Linda Finley and she is hosting week two or episode two of The Grief Gab. And uh, we had a little bit of technical difficulties here, so I'm gonna once again control our slides and hopefully in two weeks we'll be able to figure this out, Linda, and you'll be able to do this on your own. But welcome back and uh, thank you for joining. Thank you, Jonathan. Welcome, everybody. It's um, good to be back again today for our second session of Grief Gab. Um, our topic for today is um, the first about the first year of grief. Um, most times when I work with people who are grieving, one of the most frequent questions that I'm asked is, how long am I going to feel this way? So that's one of the most frequent questions that I get asked. And, and if I can reflect back to my own personal loss, I remember feeling like I just needed somebody to tell me that there was an end point to it. You know, that there was going to come a time that I was going to be okay and I wasn't going to feel that deep sense of sadness and sorrow. And so that that is mostly what people want to know. How long am I going to feel this way? So if you want to um, advance the slide, please. So we're going to talk about the first year. Um, when we talk about the first year, um, you know, we're all aware that, you know, there's the first birthdays, the first holidays, the first anniversaries, the first of everything, really, that now we're doing without our loved one being a part of that. Um, so the first year, I think people do recognize that that's probably the most difficult for, for people. And, and the question that I asked um, in the preview for this session is, you know, how long do you think the grief journey lasts? And I think most people are surprised to know that, you know, you're on a journey for the rest of your life after you've lost a loved one. And it, it's your life journey, it's your path that you're on. And our losses ultimately become part of who we are. And I often say that, you know, hopefully we can take all the good parts of the person that we loved and incorporate in them into who we are. And then we reflect that to others and share that and our loved ones will never really be gone. Um, so, so the grief journey does last, last a lifetime. That's not to say that, you know, people are sitting for years on end grieving, you know, 24 seven, nobody can grieve 24 seven, our bodies would not sustain that. So, so you do need to have some breaks in that. But the first year is really the worst. Um, it's often said that grief is, it comes in two parts. The first is actually the loss. And then the second is what we call remaking of a life. Um, because we do have to reestablish what our life is after our loved one died. And there's a lot of pieces that go along with that. Um, so if you might advance the slide, please. There are some myths about grief. Um, typically what I do when I, I host a group like this is I, I put the question out there um, for people to say, you know, yes or no to these things. But um, again, grief shouldn't last longer than a year. There's people that often think that, right? They think that once you get to that year, that's going to be it. Okay, you got you got past all those things, you should be fine. And in fact, what really happens, and I see this particularly, I see it across the board, but I see it particularly with widows and widowers, um, that you know, that first year anniversary comes up and people are anticipating that date that, you know, okay, I'm going to get to that first year. And then guess what? They wake up the day after the first year and they really don't feel any different. And so that first year has passed and now we're going to get into the second year. And that's what we're going to talk about at our next session. We're going to talk about that second year because that second year, I think, is more so people don't recognize what's going on for people who are grieving. Um, another myth is, is that most people think that women grieve more than men. And that is the furthest from the truth. Men grieve just as deeply as women do. They just express it differently. Um, I often say when I'm working particularly with men, I don't ever say to men, you know, how are you feeling about whatever it is? I often ask them, what do you think? Because when you tell men, what do you think? It's not tapping into those, the word feelings. And it's kind of, it opens up a better conversation. Um, people think moving on means that we've recovered from grief. And again, I think that we recover from our reactions and our responses to grief, but I don't like the word recovered or resolved or, you know, all these different things that people say once you get to some point and then all of a sudden it, it seems as though that loss is behind you and it really is not. And moving on means you're forgetting your loved one. People who are grieving, this is really something difficult that they deal with is thinking that if they look as though they're moving on and they, they seem as though they're okay, they somehow feel like they're dishonoring their loved one. You know, that if they think that they're doing something that's happy or something that's giving them some joy and I often say that what ultimately happens for all of us who are grieving is that we do come to realize at some point that that grief and joy can coexist. And I think that's ultimately what we really need to do. And the other thing is what we need to do is we need to find ways that we can stay connected to our loved ones. And um, I don't know which session it is. It's 
I think it's session four, we're going to talk about ways that people um, can stay, feel like they're staying connected to their loved ones in, in healthy and meaningful ways. Um, so some of these, these are considered myths. So I'm going to switch to the next slide, please. So that first year we call is a year of disruptions, right? So everything in our life is disruptive. What we're actually trying to do is we're trying to learn how to survive. And this is when people really need the support to, to learn how to survive. And, you know, People have their loved ones around in those first few days of the funeral, maybe that first month. And, you know, there's all that support there. There's a lot of people who say, if you need anything, let me know. I can tell you but nine times out of 10 that, you know, that person who's grieving is not going to call that person who said that. Most likely they're not even going to remember who said it. And so we're learning how to survive that first year. So some things that are disruptive, our routine is disrupted, right? So if we have a loved one that maybe we were caring for them, they had, you know, they were sick or what have you, and then all of a sudden they no longer are, have to take care of that person, right? And then there's all the different routines, like simple things like going to the grocery store together, going mm -hmm. to church together. Um, you know, maybe they had a, a night out with friends. There's all kinds of ways that, you know, our lives are part of a routine that is completely disrupted when that other person is no longer there. You know, I often say that, you know, our loved one is not just gone. They're gone in all of the ways that they're part of our life, all of the ways that they are in our lives were intertwined. And, and so that determines the depth of the grief is how much did we, how much time did we spend with this loved one? How much were they a part of our life? And all those things are going to be very different. Um, one thing I, again, recollecting, I, I lost my mom when I was 26 years old and I talked to her every day on the phone. Right. So that was a routine for me that I talked to her every day. And when she died, I can tell you, honestly, for years, I would click in my head. Oh, I have to call her to tell her. And I mean, it was such a part of my daily routine. And some people think, oh, my gosh, you should be well over that by now. But it, it comes back. You know, it just it does come back that that teeny little thought that oh, and then you realize, oh, no, and then there's reality. I can't call her. She's not there. So our social life is disruptive, right? And again, often with widows and widowers, they had groups of people they might have hung out with, and now they're the third wheel. And so, you know, what what are they? What social life are they going to, you know, rebuild? You know, how how much was it disruptive? You know, there's things people, you know, go out out of our lives when we lose a loved one because they no longer associate with, you know, you're no longer a couple, and they don't think of that like specifically. But the person who's grieving thinks of that. You know, I don't have my significant other here. You know, it's like we have this one gal who who comes with us. My husband has all these golfing buddies. And, you know, they get together with the wives. And this one gal, she lost her husband about two years ago. And she always shows up. They always invite her. But she always has tears, you know. And I've had one incident where we were at a, a gathering together. And we started talking and, and she started talking about, you know, her husband and she started crying. And literally another lady said, now you need to stop that now. You, you should be well done with that. And, you know, me sitting there, Miss Grief Gab, I'm like, oh, my gosh. So I reached out to her and I was like, I'm really sorry. I know that people, you know, respond like that because it's uncomfortable for them. But this lady literally came right out with that statement to her right, right in front of all of us. And so there's a lot of ways that our lives are disrupted in a social manner. And, and again, it, it upsets our, our rhythm, it upsets our routine, it upsets what our life was before our loved one died. Obviously there's a lot of emotional disruption, right? So when people die, you associate all those feelings, the shock and the sadness and the disbelief and all those things that we can experience. Um, and that goes on for so much longer again than people realize. And that's one thing that I'm gonna emphasize throughout this whole series is that it's really important that we recognize that all of these grief responses do not just happen to people during those first few months or during that first year or during that second year, they can last for a long time. And that does not mean that there's something wrong with that person. There is not. And there's ways that we can help people to talk about what it is that they're going through. There's ways that we can be better supportive of people. And then hopefully I'll share some things like that with you as well. And I think one of the most important things is, again, reaching out and providing that opportunity for people to talk. Like I did with this one gal who lost her husband. You know, I literally reached out and I was like, I know this must be really hard on you. And there's kind of like this connection that we've made since then. You know, and it's it's kind of like she's not shy to say anything when I'm there. And so 
again, just recognizing that these things that go on for us when we're grieving, they go on for so much longer. There's physical disruption. You know, sometimes people, when they experience a loss, they might have had problems prior to the loss with headaches or stomach aches or different things that bothered them. And these physical things can continue to happen afterwards. And sometimes they get worse. Um, and, it, you know, we feel grief physically as well. And, and I don't know if this is true, but I've read it places is that, you know, they say that your brain can't distinguish between physical pain and emotional pain. And so, again, remember that hijacked brain? It's, it's almost like, again, you're very confused. You don't know what's going on. So that's when, as caregivers, we recommend that people, at least within that first six months after their loss, go see their family physician um, and, and at least get checked out. Don't leave things, you know, if your headaches are worse, your, you know, physical ailments are worse, always have that checked out. Um, a lot of us might have heard that they say that the loss of a spouse, that the other spouse, the surviving spouse has a higher incidence that within that first six months, they also would pass away even if they don't have any, you know, underlying conditions um, before the loss. You know, they talk about that broken heart syndrome. It's a very real thing that happens for people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So touch the, the slide, please. Okay. So again, day, I already probably went through all this, but I'll just, so anyways, day, the routine disruptions is your daily schedule, no longer caring for the loved one, um, returning to the marital bed. That's hard for people who are, you know, married, um, no longer doing somebody's laundry is part of the routine. You know, think about all the little simple things. Those are the things that, that those of us on the outside don't see those little simple ways that this person was part of our life. Um, so you can switch to this slide. And again, the social disruptions, I guess I went ahead of myself. But anyway, so you know, loss of friends, people feel disconnected. You know, like this, this, this gal, this friend of mine, she, she had said that to me many times. I feel like I'm disconnected. As much as I'm enjoying being here, it is really hard for me. But you know what? She keeps showing up. And that's what I tell people. Just show up. You know, mm -hmm. if people are inviting you and, and just show up. And if last minute you feel that you can, it's okay to not show up. If you show up and it's not okay once you're there, it's it's okay to excuse yourself and say, I need to go home. But but showing up is important because again, those invitations will be less and less if we don't show up sometimes. Um, social disrupting, you know, isolating from the world. People, when they're grieving, they don't want to be out in the world. So that's okay for people to do that to protect themselves. But if that goes on for too long, then that's a problem. That's something that we need to talk about because we need that human connection. We need to be out doing things. We need those respites from our grief. As much as they feel, again, that we might be dishonoring our loved ones, we need those respites. Just like we need to sleep every night, right? Like I said just a few minutes ago, we cannot grieve 24 seven. Nobody would, nobody would stand that. Um, pressures to date or to have another child. You know, those are some things that are disruptive. Um, and most times people say, you know, they feel like a square peg in a, in a round world. That's basically what it is. I had a um, bereaved mother say to me one time that she felt that that she was standing in the middle of the road and all the cars were, were you know, passing by her real fast. And she felt like, you know, her whole, she was just standing there in this grief and the whole world was going on. And she said, I actually wish that one of them would run me over. You know, that's that's how bad she was feeling. And then it's very, very understandable um, with, with losses that, you know, sometimes people feel they don't talk about they want to take their lives. That's a whole nother issue. And at the end of our presentation today, I'll, I'll speak about that just for a minute. Um, but it is not uncommon to feel like you just don't want to be here. Um, again, back to my own loss with my, I lost my mother. And then a year later, I lost my daughter. And I can remember literally sitting there, welled up with tears, with this intense grief, and thinking to myself, dear Lord, just let me close my eyes and be done with this. Mm. You know, it's not like I made any plan to do that. It just was so painful and so overwhelming. And for me, I felt like I didn't really have the support that I needed. I was, you know, new to grief, <laughs> I'd say that. But, um, but I just wanted to close my eyes and be done with it. And when people tell me something along those lines, I assure them that there's nothing wrong with them as long as they're not contemplating anything, as long as they're not thinking about something they should be doing. But that is, a, and I do share my own personal experience. So I think, again, that helps with that connection. Like, wow, you felt that too. And it's like, yes, I mean, that's just something that I dealt with. And it was very painful. 
So you can switch the slide. So emotional disruptions, we talked about the grief brain, people in this grief fog. And again, that's a very real thing that goes on. Um, it's often said that the um, two to four mark after the, the loss, people experience what we call a heightened awareness of their grief. And you'd be amazed at how many people I talk to during that time period who say to me, I don't know what's wrong with me. I would think by now I, I should be better, but I just, I feel like I'm getting worse. I feel like as time goes on, I'm getting worse. And again, that's a real common experience. And, and again, as caregivers, we can create that opportunity to that space for them to, to listen to us, say to them, it's okay, there's nothing wrong with you, that that's all part of what this grief is. Um, again, if people have fear and anxiety about the future, about the past, and you know, we'll talk about some more of those things later on in our in our, our seminars about you know how people, what are the would have, should have, could have that we cannot go back. And those would have, should have, could have do create fear for us and anxiety. So that's really hard to deal with. Um, mm -hmm. One of the other things is having to put away personal belongings. How hard is that? You know, and I'm going to use my friend again as an example. I was just at her house Tuesday night and she had boxes and boxes of things. And she had said that she was going to get her husband's um, children because it was a second marriage to come over and decide what it was that they wanted. And the other gal that was there, she said, are you sure you want to do that? And she says, yes, I'm ready. Right. And she did say that early on, people are like, when are you going to clean out his stuff? When are you going to do these things? And I do say, and I think I said this in our last session, is that I always tell people, if it's your space that those belongings are occupying, it's up to you to decide what you want to do with them. You know, we can close the door. We can put a blanket over things. Um, we can knock some pictures down if they're really bothering us. So so that's something that causes a lot of disruption for people. Again, the year of first. And then there's the triggers and triggers, again, are something I'm going to talk about as we go along here. But there are so many triggers, again, that that prolong this grief journey. There's, you know, the smell of something the you know, spring in the air, you know, summer's coming, the first snowfall. You know, it's not just, you know, something that would be obvious. Right. It's, it's just those little things that just create triggers that that disrupt our, our routine, disrupt what we're doing and what we're feeling. And so that's really important. And I always say, you know, we recognize those triggers. We don't judge them. You know, they can be very different for, for people and they may sound odd, but they're not. And so we, mm -hmm. again, encourage people that what they're experiencing, it's okay. Again, I always say, as long as you're not hurting yourself or somebody else, it is okay. Tell me about that is how I, I you know, work with people. Tell me about that, creating that opportunity. So you can go ahead and switch the slide. Okay, then the physical disruptions, the sleep changes, appetite changes. Um, people have comorbidities before they're lost. Those things could be worse. I've already said that. It is very true that we have a compromised immunity when we're grieving, again, because it's wearing on your body and your body is struggling to deal with that. Your mind is. And so, again, it's another good reason to, you know, recommend people that they go and get checked out and go another time and another, you know, go as much as you need. Don't leave anything just hanging out there. Unfortunately, a lot that happens with people when they do go to a family physician is the first thing they'll do is recommend, you know, medication. Mm -hmm. And I often have people say to me, you know, is that something that I should be considering? And I tell them, I can't give you an opinion on that. Again, as a caregiver, we have to stay within our boundaries and say, I can't give you an opinion on that, but do you need to really discuss that and see how much, how, much benefit you think you would get out of it. But I do share that some people do need to be on medication to take the edge off. I do share that, you know, that that's an experience that's been shared with me, but that is not me telling them that's what you need to decide to do. Um, so that's something that, and again, the broken heart syndrome that we already, I already, I'm sure, like I said, I think I got ahead of my, I got ahead of my slides. <laughs> I didn't need my slides, John. <laughs> um, so anyways, we're going to go back to the grief dance. I think we talked about this the last session, right? Um, we we kind of touched upon the you know the stages of grief and the different models of grief, but at the end of the day, if we can just remember, if we see this visual and say, you know, this is what it is. It's a grief dance. It's it's people getting up every day and putting one foot in front of the other and trying to get through that day. And as caregivers or loved ones who care for this person who's grieving, we just need to to create that space and that opportunity for them to get that support that they need. And, you know, there's not a lot of infrastructure in our culture that supports people who are grieving. There really isn't. I mean, there's, you know, there's hospice support groups. And I worked for 20 years with hospice in upstate New York. And I can't tell you how many times people from the community would find the group and say, I thought I, I couldn't come to this group because my loved one didn't go through hospice but these groups are available. And it would always amaze me that the numbers of people that would show up, obviously I've got the obituaries for the town. So few people actually find these resources. 
and this is a fact that has not changed in all of the years that I've been doing this work, is that you would think with the internet, you would think that with you know social media, that people would be able to access more information and resources. And I can tell you that that has not changed in my experience with families. They don't have the brain bandwidth to actually look for resources. They can't even sit down and read more than three pages in a book or listen to more than five minutes of a podcast. You know, again, their brains are just totally hijacked. And so the, the best, again, that we can do for people, and I'll emphasize this for our time together, is that, you know, provide resources for them, direct people to the resources, whether it's online, whether it's a support group, provide that information to people. As caregivers, I tell my funeral homes all the time, make sure you have an updated list of the resources available in your community and make sure that you check it every six months at least, because the last thing you want to happen is for somebody to call a phone number and all of a sudden that phone number, they don't get anywhere with that. And you know how that is with just anything in general. It's five phone calls and three weeks later. So we want to make sure we have those resources up to date and accurate so people can access that. And so let me just go. I have a question, yeah, I have sure. a question about the, uh, you know, and it's kind of revolving around what you just said, but it says uh, groups specifically, um, which helped me, uh, Linda, when I lost someone close to me and, uh, but for my stepmother, who is still four years later grieving my father, um, I, I don't think that she um, she only went to a couple of group sessions that this was during uh, the beginning of COVID, too. So it was it was difficult for her to uh, participate. I always prefer groups being uh, live and, you know, in person. But uh, even if this is, you know, via Zoom or or something like this. Uh, I think that that's still something that um, that I could benefit from, and I know that she could, but it's been four years. And so when somebody were to come to you to say, you know, am I, uh, I think, you know, we're our own worst enemy when it comes to things like this and internalizing thoughts of uh, it's been too long and either nobody will understand or the people that lost uh, their uh, significant others uh, four years ago, probably aren't even going to be in this group anymore. Uh, what advice would you give to people that are still really, you know, using or want to take advantage of a resource like that, uh, but may be wondering if the statute of limitations is passed? Okay, so my response to that would be is that there is no statute of limitation. You know, I tell people that it doesn't matter how long it's been since your loss, that you're always welcome in this group. And then encouraging people in a way that, I can say to them, you know what, even if you're you're four years out, this is four years for the rest of your life. And these resources are there for you. And guess what? If you do go to one of these things, you can probably be some help to others because you're four years out. You know, so I encourage people to attend the, the group meetings, regardless of the time frame. I tell them they don't have to say anything. Just go observe. And I think the most other important thing is, is that go to at least three sessions. I would tell somebody who's newly bereaved that I would tell somebody who's 10 years out, go to at least three sessions, because again, you're, you're out there, you're putting yourself out there. You're, you're not isolating. You're among other people who are experiencing loss and grief. And I think within three sessions, people do realize, wow, I'm connecting with all of this. And then I tell people, you know what, if after three sessions, you feel that's not something for you, that then maybe it's not. And now with your, um, your mother, I think that, you know, for her, you can say something along those lines that, you know, just just try it out. You know, take her to the meeting if you can. Accompany her yeah. to the meeting. Most facilitators allow that. And again, encourage her that this is just a place that maybe you can be a little bit helpful. Yeah. And, and you will recognize that, wow, this one's going through that. That one's going through the other thing. And even you being there, you are a message of hope that you even got there after four years to other people. So that's how I try and encourage them and tell me, I'll go to at least three meetings, don't have to say anything, take somebody with you. Those yeah. are the things that I would suggest for that. Well, I mean, you know, those those triggers don't go away anytime soon, right? And so uh, I know I still face them after four years and imagine the good that you can do to share that with somebody else who um, is feeling the same thing, but, you know, was a little timid to be able to speak up about it. And that right. sense of community, it's gotta be very powerful. It is very powerful. Groups, support groups, particularly in grief and probably in other areas and topics are so powerful. And, and not only do they connect with other people, they, they form those relationships that then that is one of the goals of the group as a facilitator is you want them to form those relationships so that 
they're not relying on the group completely. And then they make new friends, they can meet for coffee. I mean, there's so many things that go on as a result of support groups. You know, even as far as to say, I know many people who've met their next significant other at a yeah. support group. Not that that's, that's not a place for that, but it's, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So anyways, just some red flags I talked about when people feel like I explained or shared with you that, you know, you don't want to just close my eyes and not be here. Um, mm -hmm. Some red flags to look at is that if somebody starts talking about self-harm, if they're like completely obsessed with suicide or homicide, and if they're experiencing psychotic symptoms or delusions, that's when we have, we're outside of our, our wheelhouse and we really need to have, again, those resources in place that we can refer to counseling or different, you know, there's suicide hotlines, there's, you know, different resource, a lot of resources for people. So just be cognitive of that and don't ignore it completely, but just make sure that, you know, you do have those resources in case we need to refer those things out. And so that's what I have to say today. Um, so session three, we're going to talk about grief too and beyond and why it's important as caregivers and people who I want to support people who are grieving to recognize um, that there are opportunities during that second year to continue to provide that level of service and that care for people and to continue to recognize this loss is not just going to go away. We need to be there and, and create those opportunities to continue to support people. Uh, thank you. I, I've learned uh, two things in particular that I, uh, I'm glad that I tuned in here, Linda. For our viewers who want to get in touch with you, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation or talk about you, know, you facilitating something here, how can they find you? Well, they can find me on my website, which is the um, www.morningdiscoveries.com with an O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Um, they have my telephone numbers on the website. I think if you just look up Morning Discoveries, it'll pop right up. And welcome to have a conversation. I can set up a you know complimentary Zoom call, just talk about grief and talk about what your thoughts are and what you think you need and how I can help you with that. Terrific. Well, Linda, thank you again for this. I'm excited about uh, uh, episode three in two weeks from today. Um, and uh, you guys, if you have any questions for Linda, she's been doing this a long time. So uh, if you have any questions for her, I definitely encourage you to reach out. Um, really excited to have this opportunity to learn uh, from you, Linda. And uh, thank yeah. you again for uh, well, sharing your wisdom with us. I just have one more thing. We don't want to forget our healing modality for today. Yes, so please. Just squeeze that in. So today's healing modality is going to be meditation therapy. And we're going to put up a, a, a PDF that you have information and also a link to a website that will really tell you why it's helpful, why it's useful. So we'll have those couple of resources put up for you as well. And that's our meditation healing modality. Well, I'm I'm ultimately responsible for putting this up, guys. And when Linda sends it to me, I'll uh, I'll put the practice into motion firsthand. And uh, I'll, I'm, I'm going to let you guys know how uh, effective it was. Uh, Linda, thanks again. I really appreciate everything you do for us and for this community. And uh, look forward to seeing you again in two weeks. Thank you, Jonathan.